it seems they've got a bit more space. Uh, hi, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? GM. All right. All right, everyone's hungry, so we'll do this. Before lunch, you know, make sure you pack in some uh, information. Uh, so very good morning to you all. I'm very happy to be here. I'm Yen, uh, the founding, uh, founding managing partner of High Ventures. We're an early stage investor uh, in uh, data, AI, and blockchain related uh, projects as well. Today, I'm very, very excited to have uh, with me two veterans in the space that have seen a few cycles uh, in crypto already. Uh, first up, we have Tom Schmidt from Dragonfly Capital and uh, Tony from uh, 500 Startups. So uh, I think, why not, uh, Tom uh, and Tony, why not you guys pick, um, introduce yourself and Dragonfly a little? Yeah, thanks for, thanks for having us. Excited to be on the panel. Um, hey everyone, I'm Tom. I'm a GP at Dragonfly. We're a global crypto venture fund. We've been around since 2018. Um, we only do crypto and crypto-related companies, but we really have sort of a venture-style model of partnering with teams at the earliest stages and, and helping them build, and that sort of is you know, deep in our DNA. Great, Tony. And uh, thanks, everyone. Um, thanks, Ian. Uh, I'm from 500, and we are a Silicon Valley-based uh, global venture firm. We have about 2.7 billion in uh, assets under management. Uh, we have, we we do investments all around the world. So currently, our portfolio exists about 49 companies that are unicorns, a billion dollar valuations and above. Um, we we've invested in multiple different sectors, including in crypto and blockchain. So, you know, we, uh, we had um, the founders of Solana uh, in our accelerator program uh, back in 2018. Uh, and so there's been a number of ecosystem uh, investments that we've been doing since then. All right, so I mean, given both your purviews, you guys are both from um, you know funds that look at deals globally. Tony especially has a focus in Taiwan and APAC itself. So given both this kind of a global uh, perspective that you both have, how have you seen the Web3 projects in APAC and the community as well differ from the global uh, projects and communities at large? Uh, why don't you start, Tom? Yeah, I think the global component is something that differentiates Dragonfly from a lot of the other larger crypto funds. Um, we've really been global since day one. Um, we have about half of our you know, LP-based portfolio team out in Asia, mostly in Singapore, but sort of broadly throughout, throughout East Asia, and um, then about half the team in the US. And we really see you know, crypto is different than Web2 in that you launch your project, and immediately you have people all around the world becoming part of your community, being part of your, your uh, product on, on the first day you launch it. And so for us, um, you know, we have sort of a global perspective, but not a global mandate. Um, so we try to find the best teams around the world, back them, um, help them you know, go global from wherever they, they are, but not so much trying to um, have that sort of 50-50 split or specifically choose teams from Asia, specifically to choose teams from North America. I think just empirically, when we look at our portfolio, or if you just look at the past five years of crypto investment and what has done well, um, kind of what we've seen is that um, the teams that have done the best in Asia are actually um, a lot of sort of CFI or CDFI teams that um, have really innovative takes on um, go-to-market, really in innovative takes on, on business models. I mean, you look at the top five exchanges, it's Binance, Bybit, OK, you know, BitGet. Um, and so, I think that's an area where Asia is just like so far ahead of uh, the US and kind of the West more broadly. Um, I think the other area where we've seen really outperformance or, or great characteristics of, of teams in Asia is not so much Asia specific, but having a, a global presence where you're taking these pockets of talent and helping them um, branch outside of whatever country they are, whatever locale they, they are, um, and really find users all around the world. So it's not just, hey, I have a great tech team. I'm, I'm only in Taiwan serving a Taiwanese audience, but we have this great tech team in Taiwan, and they're actually serving people all around the world. And so I think those are the areas where we find sort of outperformance, specifically in, in Asia. But um, you know, who knows what the, the future is going to look like. Great. And Tony, you've done a lot uh, in Taiwan as well, and many have gone global. So what's your take on Taiwan APAC versus the world? So it, it actually reflects some of the patterns that we saw in Web2, where you, know, you have some of the global incumbents today that started out as uh, startups back in the US, and then from a regional basis, either in Asia or Taiwan or you know, Korea, Japan, Southeast Asia, you sort of see that the local uh, equivalent, right? Like the Google for China or the eBay for Malaysia, or um, you know, that tends to be something that we saw early in the Web3 world as well. 
Um, but they're really targeting that local market. You'll have a centralized exchange for, you know, like my coins for Taiwan. Um, but also, I think what we've been able to uh, really see is what Tom and Mechen, which is founders that are building globally from the day one. Um, and I think that's what's really changed between Web 2 and Web 3, is this instant access to global markets and global, global user base and distribution, uh, which we didn't have well, we didn't have as readily in Web2, but arguably we needed that for Web2 to, to lay those distribution rails, whether it be Discord or Telegram or Twitter or, or Reddit, mm -hmm. to allow for the Web3 uh, globalization that we're seeing now. Okay. I mean, personally, I, I totally resonate with, with both of you, especially I think since um, you know the weeks leading up to Taipei Blockchain Week, we're just really excited that we have so many people from around the world being here today, kind of echoing your point that you know within the Web3 space, especially that it's always global from day one. You don't have to be locked into very specific locales. But then again, I mean, um, APAC is super fragmented, right? Basically, no two, almost no two countries in uh, APAC speak exactly the same language natively. So um, from your perspectives, um, what are some of the, the models that you've seen succeed for uh, local projects, no matter where uh, in APAC, from their kind of origin country and going global? What are some of the successes you've seen, um, the models that they approached, and um, how you have, your funds have been able to help them go global? Yeah, I mean, I think when it comes to CFI, um, again, it's about finding um, that talent of founders who have maybe have experience in, for example, O2O -O in China, um, and then leveraging that to build a great local business that can sort of go after a local market. Um, I think obviously when it comes to CFI, you then have the overhead of um, having appropriate local licenses, having appropriate local, you know, uh, fiat on and off ramps. So there are, you know, some considerations there. But when I think about um, you know, some of our founders or some of the, the team members of portfolio companies in Asia more broadly, um, it's really more about having a global team. So you have, you know, an engineer in Taiwan, you have like a designer in India, um, you have another founder in somewhere in Europe or in the US. Um, and it's about, you know, being able to tap into these, these global talent pools um, and then build a product, build a DeFi protocol, build an NFT project that can serve people wherever they are. So it's not so much um, going specifically after any, any given locale. Again, I think that's very relevant if you're maybe trying to build a wallet or trying to build an exchange. But if you're trying to build a, a protocol or something truly in like Web3, um, there are maybe some local um, considerations that you might want to bring in. But broadly speaking, it's about you know, bringing together sort of a, a global talent pool. Tony? So we've, we've really been uh, fortunate in the types of um, founder networks that we've been able to build, uh, both in the US and around the world. And so we've, we're able to see some of the early signals of something working, whether it's a you know, founder uh, that's outside of Silicon Valley or even outside the US. Um, and we've been really fortunate to be able to support some of the projects here, in, even, even in Taiwan. You, know, you look at um, Blockto. Um, and Ludex, uh, they are really great examples of just building globally for global audience and user base from uh, day one. Um, another example is uh, Saibavo, which is uh, it's a digital assets wallet for institution, uh, institution investors. And we did that deal uh, last year. And within 12 months, they had a, a, an exit that Circle acquired them turned out to be one of the largest uh, software exits in Taiwan's history. And so we were really extremely lucky to be able to just be able to find those that really strong technical talent that was building for a global use case. And in that particular case, it was for the institutionals. And that's a really big you know, thesis that we have going forward. Um, but we're, we're really thrilled to have been able to be part of those projects. And I will say that, you know, there, there have been leapfrogging, right? Like Web3 really, I mean, technology allows countries to just leapfrog and you know, not have to adopt the current incumbent rails, uh, you know, especially in banking. Like, and so probably in the early two, 2020s, most of the value of the transactions that were occurring were occurring from uh, Asia or East Asia specifically. So about 30% and, and East Asia was number one. Um, in the last two years, we've seen that shift where the value of the transactions have, you know, now East Asia is number four in that. And interestingly, the ones that have risen uh, to exceed East Asia is one, Western Europe, 
Uh, number two is North America, not, not a big surprise. But number three is uh, South and Central Asia. Uh, and so we, we follow these patterns and we see like, hey, this is an opportunity for, what, what you see where there's, uh, where they don't have the infrastructure where there's unbanked, it's a huge opportunity. And so given that, one of the, the areas that we've been actively investing is Africa and we see a tremendous amount of um, activity there today. Uh, but still, a lot of the sophistication that we've seen from the building of the models, tokenomics to smart contracts comes from some of the early projects out in Asia. So I, I think the takeaway is then that obviously there is a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot, a lot of, um, you know, space in the global, uh, global kind of a Web3 market, especially in Asia. We see so much activity, obviously Africa as well, but with a more kind of a, a decentralized kind of a, and a global DNA within the company itself, maybe leveraging on the technology kind of excellence and capability out here in Taiwan, but build out a company kind of a DNA across regions so you understand the local nuances in the various different markets that you want to go for and also the local relationships that you can build within the team itself just by setting up the team and building a, a DNA. Right? I think that that's the takeaway so far. Um, and so I think maybe we could uh, address also the, the elephant in the room, right? Right now we're in the midst of a, you know, macroeconomic downturn. Um, I think from both a traditional finance perspective and a more uh, Web3 perspective, we are, winter is here, basically, right? So, but what, what's your take on that? You, um, I mean, are funds still deploying? Um, have your kind of strategies changed um, from, you know, last year when we're still seeing, you know, great bull runs and then to the start of this year where thinking, things are starting to kind of adjust? Uh, have you seen differences? And, in terms of your investment strategy, have you been shifting uh, towards certain geos as well? So, Tony, what, what, what do you think? You've, you've been addressing this quite a bit within a yeah. startup space. I mean, um, it's so interesting because TradFi and DeFi should have decoupled, uh, but you know, in a bear market, everything just went down. Um, and I, I would say that I, I'd like, you know, I could put it in perspective, right? So if you look at Q1 of this year, um, crypto funding was at an all-time high uh, at 10 billion in Q1. And then it pulled back dramatically in Q2, it went down to about 7.1 billion. Uh, and then Q3 is down to about 4.7, 4.8 billion. So uh, about, you know, a little bit more than a 50% drop since the beginning of the year. We'll see where it comes in with Q4. Uh, but it's worth noting that even with that 4.7, 4.8 billion, it's still much higher than January of 2021 when the bull market just like took off. So January 20, 2021, Q1 of that year was 3.8 billion. So we've, you know, we've been through multiple cycles in crypto, but also just generally. Um, <laughs> I'm old enough to have gone through the dot-com crash and then obviously the 2008 um, a global financial crisis. And what you see there is very similar to what we're seeing here, which is like a rise in, in investor interest and then a pullback. But then when, once it pulls back, the baseline it resettles is not where it started. It starts, the baseline comes back to, the reversion to a mean comes back to something that was much higher than even when the beginning of the bull run. And that's exactly what we're seeing here. Um, and so I think, you know, even, even if you look at uh, the, the number of uh, unicorns that get minted every quarter. So in Q3, there are 25 unicorns around the world. Uh, six of those came from uh, crypto companies. So accounting for 25% of value being created and, you know, companies uh, and projects being created that exceed a billion dollars in value, uh, that's pretty still impressive for the market that we're in. So when we think about you know, markets, it, 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 we're not so much trying to time, we're not so much trying to even predict what that macro looks like, although we have our thesis around it, but it's really about um, being able to continue to build through those cycles because you want to be ready when the markets turn around. So that's what we're excited about. Totally, I think, um, so, 
my, my pri previous life before I became an investor, we were basically founders, and we founded companies in 2008, 2009, which was basically the last big major market downturn. And as you can see, Facebook, uh, some of the best companies in the world, Google, Facebook, uh, in China, you have your ByteDance, TikToks, Tencent, everyone was basically rising from the ashes. So really, uh, we, we, totally, uh, we, we totally love the fact that right now the market is kind of readjusting itself and we are at basically the best time to build probably in the next decade. Hopefully we don't have to see another market correction within the next decade, right? But if so, then this is probably the best time to build, right, in a downturn. And uh, there are a lot of opportunities, a lot of costs are significantly lower now as compared to a bull cycle, right? So what do you think, Tom? Um, yeah, I mean, we're similar in that we have sort of a, a true venture model, right? We have a very long fun life and that's been sort of a nice blessing for us in that we don't have to think about sort of the day-to-day -day macro, uh, you know, fluctuations in, in the market. Um, we also just closed our third fund um, beginning of this year and so we've kind of just started to deploy out of that. So we're feeling quite optimistic in the sense of, hey, there's still a lot of great talent flowing into the space. Prices have come down quite a bit. Um, let's back those teams that are going to be generational companies and sort of, um, you know, uh, help them build into the next, into the next bull market. Um, I think the big challenge is, is sort of, you know, a fewfold. Um, one is, um, you know, if you're a team that is building a product, you have to build a product that's also going to do well in a, bull, in a bear market, right? There's a lot of teams that raised last year building a product that was sort of a bull market product, and now they don't have the users, they don't have the traction, they don't, they don't have the revenue um, to be able to, you know, raise an extension, raise more capital, actually keep this thing funded. So it's not enough just to build, but you also have to be able to get traction in sort of the macro condition that we're in. Um, I think also there's you know, sort of knock-on effects from a higher cost of capital if you're you know, building something that involves uh, lending or borrowing or credit. Um, and just sort of overall, I think, reduction of um, volatility or sort of froth in the space, which can be good and bad. Um, but it's about finding those teams and finding those entrepreneurs that are equipped to sort of build in this market condition. But I mean, for us, again, we're pretty excited. I think we still see a lot of great talent, a lot of great teams. We're still uh, writing checks, um, but it's just depend depend dependent on um, finding those teams that are actually going to be able to um, survive and persevere through the market. So would you say that um, your d deployment process has become uh, more conservative or are there certain sectors that you've been deploying super fast in now that you know it's actually a buyer's market right now? Yeah, I mean, I, mean, I would say um, our diligence process and our sort of criteria have not changed too much, but the nice thing now is processes are much slower. Um, there's not the sort of, hey, we need to answer by the end of the week that you saw in 2021. And um, certainly we have a lot more pricing power, which is, is great for us. But I think it's also nice for founders to be able to build the coalition that you want. Um, you know, There's a lot of talent coming into the market right now, which we're seeing you know, teams in our portfolio just sort of gobble up. Um, so that's also been sort of nice to see. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think uh, fundamentally nothing really changes. It's sort of some of these variables get tweaked, but the overall sort of strategy and thesis is not uh, you know, deviating too much. Yeah, I would, I, I would add to that. I think um, what's also happening is that we're actually seeing more deals within our strike zone. So, you know, it, as, a, as a fund manager, we have to be, you know, we are very disciplined about the range that we look at. And it's pretty easy to look at a great project and be really excited about it. Uh, but if the valuation exceeds our target, you know, it's it's one of those things where okay, well, I'll I'll, I'll write a check as an angel um, for a really expensive project, and I and I've done that, but I w I won't have the support of the fund, or I won't be able to deploy out of the fund, uh, regardless of how you know great that project is. Now we're starting to see this you know the shift, and now we're seeing a lot more that are w within that strike zone. So it allows us to you know continue our pace. Um, but also just be able to continue to look at projects in a in in the similar way that we were before. Okay. So let's unpack that a little um, a little more, especially for the builders and founders in the room. So what is your strike zone? What are you looking for uh, in, in terms of a deal within the the parameters of the fund itself? What is the stages that you go after? Are you um, token sensitive? Are you open to that? Uh, and what are the ticket sizes that you would typically deploy? So I mean we're we're first check investors, so it means that basically you are uh, you and a, and a founder have an idea. Those that's when we want to start working with you and start fleshing out ideas. 
Um, there, you know, check sizes, uh, the first check would be anywhere, well, anywhere between 100K to 200K, maybe up to 500K, uh, but then that's really at the sort of pre-seed seed, seed uh, stage. Um, so there's no, well, oftentimes there's no product, um, but once you get the product market fit and you start, you know, building and launching, um, then uh, if we were in there from the beginning, it allows us to continue to build uh, ownership af after that point. But we enter with small checks. And Tom, are you guys multi-stage or are you more specific first check? Yeah, our our third fund is 650 mil, which is sort of the largest fund we've done to date. Um, and the thinking with that was historically we've been very early stage. Um, and the idea now is being able to stay early-ish, but be able to keep scaling up with the team. So um, you know, we do checks <clears throat> all the way down from three mil to 50 mil. Um, it just depends on, um, you know, it's sort of a byproduct of the stage and ownership. Um, and it's, hey, are we putting in a check size that gets us meaningful ownership so we can spend a lot of the time, spend a lot of time working with the team and sort of make this check worth it? Um, and are we making sure that like this fits in the context of the fund and we're not you know, cutting too small a check to make sure that it, it isn't worth it on, on either end? So um, there's not really a hard and fast formula. It's more sort of a, a byproduct of the round. So um, I know 500 is equity and token. Uh, you're, you're fine with both. For Dragonfly, are you looking for products and, and businesses that specifically have a token model or not? No, I mean, um, over half of our portfolio is, or about half of our portfolio is equity only, so no token. Um, and at the earliest stages, we actually um, almost never do a token only investment. Um, I think a lot of teams, you know, it, you need to build, you need to find product market fit first, you need to find something that's retentive and sticky, I think before you think about launching a token. And so a lot of teams, they come to us and they have an idea and they have sort of a token concept and then later on they realize, oh, maybe a token actually doesn't make sense here. Maybe it actually makes sense as just a normal, you know, boring you know, equity company and we take a fee, we charge some money and that's the way it works. Or, hey, maybe we have an idea for a token and down the road there's actually a better idea for a token and we have, we have sort of, um, you know, a different plan or maybe we want to actually iterate on the product a couple times before we think about launching a token. And so for us, um, I think finding teams that are aligned with that vision of uh, trying to build a great product that people love to use and then thinking about sort of roads and monetization is, is sort of the best alignment of um, founders, team, and uh, users. So, so um, I mean, back in the, in the bull run itself, right, everything was very token driven and it's all about, you know, same day checks as you were saying. So. So do you think kind of the, the whole token design model, I think a lot of projects that we've seen back in those days, uh, a lot of these tokenomic designs especially were kind of you know, rough and very, very generic or maybe you know, flawed in, in many ways. So are you saying that right now, given the whole bear run, uh, investors are more open to kind of work mano a mano with the teams to design uh, the entire tokenomics and really take it back down to scratch? Or you know, is that specific to Dragonfly? No, I mean, I, don't, I can't speak for other funds, but I don't think our investment philosophy has changed. This was true even for us in 2021. Um, I think the, the issues that we see with tokens are not so much, um, hey, this, this tokenomic design is incorrect. It's you didn't build a retentive product in the first place. So now you're trying to you know, basically go public for this company that isn't actually working. Um, or two, you know, once you launch a token, it really sort of cuts off other exit paths, right? It's, that's a, you know, a, a little bit of a, 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 a game limiter. And so for us, when we look at teams, we want to make sure that we find teams that are sort of similarly aligned to us. Um, so it's not so much a, hey, you need to tweak this token allocation or how this token actually works, but um, hey, are you actually trying to build a product that people love and then we can figure out um, if a token makes sense down the line. Okay, great. So. So, I mean, looking forward a little, right? So, uh, are there currently and going forward, are there certain themes that you're looking for specifically? I think, uh, you know, just to boldly predict a little, I think very early on back in 17, uh, it was the uh, ICO boom that really brought in a lot of people into the space. And then later on, the, uh, the advent of DeFi, and we brought more retail into the market. Last year, it was NFT. So right now, what are the top themes that both of you are each looking at within the space itself? Yeah, I mean, I think we tend to be a little bit less um, thesis driven um, and a little bit more sort of bottoms up, grassroots, just looking at what's actually happening on chain or, or in the industry and looking at data and using that to sort of um, think critically about you know what the future looks like. And so for us, um, a lot of it comes down to founders, pre-product, just an idea, um, and, and sort of you know backing them. But 
when I think about categories that I find interesting, um, it's stuff like real world assets. Um, Maker just hit a new all time high for like income coming from RWAs, and like I think generally speaking, they will do better than than teams that just sort of need um, you know, offer extreme leverage on top of existing crypto products. Um, looking at things like stable coins, stable coin issuance just hit a new all time high, and you know velocity on these is also incredible. Finding ways to sort of lean on top of that consumer crossover plays, infrastructure plays, a lot of these come down to us also having, you know, pretty much everyone on the team has an engineering background and we sometimes pack on stuff and we sort of have needs and have problems that we like to solve and back companies that are actually solving our own problems. So there's some broad categories that we find interesting, but I think a lot of it comes down to is this the right founder for the problem? Um, is, this prob is this product actually going to get traction in a bear market? And is the team the right team that's actually going to have the right go to market for this product? So there's many different conditions that go into us thinking about a particular investment. Tony. Yeah, for us, it's similar to some of the categories that Tom mentioned, like infrastructure and tooling and others. And the one couple of things I would add into that is uh, the rise of institutionals. Um, I think that's going to be a really interesting. Opportunity. So, if you look at what, you know our investment in Saibabo, um, it was institutional uh, digital assets management, and we think about a lot of how DeFi really allowed retail to participate. But if you look at the you know percentage of just transaction volume, it's still retail only hits about at the most ten percent, and so. Everything else is institutional, whether it's large institutional, or professional institutional, or mid-cap institutional. So 90% of that volume is being driven by institutional investors that don't necessarily have the right tools in place. So if you think about the crypto market today, that's a really, really um, very, very highly motivated reflection of what you know the demand is out there. Because it's hard, right? Like, and so what you see out there is like, you know, these DeFi protocols, um, which is incredible, but a lot of the institutions can't actually implement them because, you know, it's, it's sort of like similar to uh, open source software, right? You, there's a ton of open source out there, but, you know, when you get, you know, a, a fund manager, they just can't implement open source because they don't have their own developers in house or they just, they don't want to hire Accenture or whoever. Um, so there's a, an incredible untapped opportunity right now. Um, and, and we've, we actually see that in the DeFi, CeFi split. So even though you know, DeFi has really been driving the forefront of um, a lot of the trends that we're seeing, it's still anywhere between 50% to 70% captured by uh, uh, CeFi. So the, interestingly, the, the country with the, the lowest split is still the US, which is still majority CeFi. But that's, they have uh, more DeFi than anywhere else. And then the, the one that is the highest proportion of CeFi is East Asia. You could probably guess why. Um, and so the, there's that, that represents an enormous opportunity, which is the, you know, not only the rise of institutionals, but also as we continue to support funding people who are building the right tools for DeFi, um, that proportion, uh, that ratio changes. The other thing I would just uh, throw in there is, as I mentioned, sort of that leapfrogging, the rise of the, what we call the rise of the next. Uh, these are territories and regions that are only coming online right now. Um, so in the next decade, there's gonna be more people that uh, come online than the entire internet population exists today. And what are they gonna use? They're gonna use the rails that are being created now. And so that's the population that we're also uh, looking at and we're really excited about. Okay, so um, again, let's be a little forward looking. I mean, uh, it's the cusp of the new year, right? So what are your outlooks for both the macro market as well as the whole uh, Web3 market? Do you think uh, it will change for large part of next year, or are we expecting something more of a recovery in 2024? I don't know what your house views are on this. Uh, Tony, why don't you start? Well, again, we, we don't speculate on the macro markets, but what we, do, um, we, what we do look very closely at is just how markets have uh, responded to previous ex, you know, exogenous shocks. So if you look at um, the dot-com crash, so this is predates crypto now, dot-com crash, it took about 
12 years before there was this huge bull run on technology. And, you know, that started, um, I think, you know, you know, back in 2001 when, you know, for, for the next, like, call it seven years, um, there was not a lot of funding in venture. There was not a lot of returns in venture. But what was built during that time was incredible, right? Like, you, you could have, uh, this is not investment advice, <laughs> but you could have just been writing checks left and right in Silicon Valley to, you know, any founder, um, and you would have hit upon a few that were building incredible companies. Uh, and then, so, you know, some of the, 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 you know, the, the enormous incumbents that we know today were really built during that period. And then after 2008, uh, the global financial crisis, again, you know, like the Ubers and Dropboxes and Stripes and, 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 and like all of uh, social media after that as well were enormous. So that's another uh, example of if you did not deploy during that time because of the global financial crisis or a Lehman collapse, that was a, in, the, the opportunity cost for that was enormous. So when we look at that and we see the cycle this time around, it's all about being able to time diversify when you deploy, right? Um, at, you know, just continue that strategy. So we haven't really changed our strategy. Again, what, we've, what, what we have changed is we've seen more opportunities come into our strike zone. So we continue to ex execute our strategy and then we'll see more opportunities that way. Um, and then you know, continue to, to make sure you're doing that across uh, cross vintages as well as you know, throughout the years. And so uh, for us next year, you know, we, you know, in Taiwan, in, in Asia, in, in, in the US, we continue to try to um, target the same pace as well as the same uh, type of uh, uh, check sizes and, and ownership, so. Thank you. Oh, uh, quick wrap up. Yeah. Similarly, I mean, we don't try to predict price movements on like a one year time horizon or anything like that. But I think if you zoom out, you know, there tend to be these two to three year cycles in crypto and those tend to get driven by new innovations from founders coming into the space, um, building something brand new that sort of kicks off a new cycle of innovation. And so for us, it's about finding those teams that are going to build those generational projects and companies that are going to then kick off the next cycle. And generally that takes a little bit of while, but it's, it, it's about finding the teams that are willing to sort of go that distance and, and keep building in the bear. All right, so I think uh, the takeaway here is definitely that, you know, within the past few years within the Web3 space, there have been a lot of players that were really just chasing the money or chasing the buzz in the market. But really here we have in the house today are investors that are very, uh, have a very long view into every venture that are investing. So fundamentally, if you're building something that is of value, be it in the bear or in the bull, I think building it right now, it'll be great and something that's, uh, that's gonna last generations down the road. So I think everyone can embrace this bear with more confidence and hopefully we emerge stronger on the other side of, uh, of the market. So uh, I think that wraps it up for today. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Tom and Tony. Thank you very much. Thanks.